So there was an experienced skydiver who took, jumped out of the plane and on his way down, got to the altitude where he was supposed to pull the ripcord and he pulled the ripcord and nothing happened. But he was experienced and well-trained and so he reached for the, the ripcord of his emergency chute and when he pulled that ripcord, nothing happened as well. And at that point he knew he was in trouble and probably a goner uh, unless something happened. Well, about that time, he heard an explosion down below him and he, and he happened to look down between his feet and much to his shock, there was a man who was plummeting or, or moving, or rising up towards him. And he was trying to figure out this thing and he, and he thought, well, maybe this guy could help me. And so the guy came up and the, and the, the skydiver said, do you know anything about parachutes? And the man shook his head like this and he said, do you know anything about gas stoves? <laughs> so, so we are uh, looking at the problem of evil and suffering, of which those two men were experiencing this. Now, the problem of evil and suffering uh, goes back a long time. Uh, the person that I'm most familiar with that started the question uh, was Epicurus, uh, a Greek, and uh, the Epicurean dilemma is one that skeptics often question Christians about. How do you solve this? And in your handout, uh, it's a simple, um, three simple things. If God is willing to defeat evil, but not able, then he is not all powerful. Second, if God is able to defeat evil, but not willing, then he is not all good. And so the conclusion is, if God is both willing and able to defeat evil, why, does, why doesn't he stop evil? And that, uh, that goes on uh, sort of, and I, I've heard this question uh, put to me over, over many, many years uh, by skeptics. And I'd like to address that, this question today and next week uh, in two very different messages. If, if you have gone through times of evil and suffering, you know that intellectual answers to your questions do not help, not at the moment. In fact, uh, like Job, it might even make your experience worse. Um, and so we're, but we're going to deal with that today. So if you're going through a time of evil and suffering, and this message seems like nails on a chalkboard to you, hang on a week, come back next week, and we'll look at this problem of evil and suffering from a personal point of view and a pastoral point of view. Now, one of the things that I would say about Epicurus and skeptics I've talked to is they make one great assumption about the Epicurean dilemma, and this is in your handout. The assumption is that there are no morally justifiable and good reasons to allow evil to exist. It's just unfathomable to every skeptic I've talked to that that could possibly be true. And yet the Bible clearly both intellectually tells us it's true and gives us countless examples of it being true that we would say, yes, God is able to defeat evil and he is willing to defeat evil. And if he doesn't defeat evil and suffering in the moment, there are justifiable and moral good reasons why. Hang on, is the idea. So um, we will look at, for example, at one of the verses in uh, James 1, 2, uh, through five is a good example of this. It's companion verse, Romans five, three through five. These are verses that typically we as Christians go to when we are really confused about the problem of evil and suffering, when it hits home. James says, count it all joy. This is so uh, unintuitive to us. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And perse let perseverance have its good work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now, if you are in the middle of evil and suffering, and you read that verse that says, count it all joy, this is a head scratcher for you. But the rest of the verse, at least on an intellectual level, should give us hope. When he says, count it all joy, the Living Translation, I believe, says, have a party, throw a party. Now, it doesn't feel like a party. It doesn't seem like a party. But what James is trying to say here is that down in your gut, beneath your feelings and lament and grief, there is reason for joy. This is what I think of as um, uh, joy that's coming, 
anticipatory joy. And the idea here in these verses is that no matter what we go through, no matter how hard our suffering or evil is that we are facing, our God is a redeemer God, and he will redeem it in such a way that someday our jaws will drop and we will go, how in the world did you do that? The idea is something along this line, is that whatever it is that we lose in our present time of evil and suffering, God is able to compensate far more down the road through his redemptive story. Um, you, say, you may say, say, well, Seth, that sounds like sort of pie in the sky kind of thing. And yet I would remind all of us that for most of my life, I went to Hollywood movies, other than maybe the last 10 years or so, and what we all hoped for in the movie was a Hollywood ending. Where some kind of injustice was paid back. Justice occurred. Or some type of wrong that happened to people was made right. There's something in the human heart that longs for that. We have an awareness that there is a moral law and there is a place for justice and we want justice to prevail. This is true for all of us. In the middle of evil and suffering, what James says is, this is an anchor that can, that can hold us towards perseverance. Now, on the inside of your handout, the question that everybody goes through, your, uh, myself included, when you go through times of evil and suffering, is why? Why? And a number of years ago, um, I remember, I've talked to lots of people who've asked that question of me. He said, why would God allow this? Why wouldn't he stop this? And, and a few years ago, I don't know, maybe five or six or seven years ago, what I heard so often was, with sort of a spirit of resignation, I'm sure God has a reason for this suffering. Meaning, there may be some reason for this, but, but I don't think it's going to be all that good. It, it's, it's a question, it's, it's not a rhetorical question, it's sort of an accusation question towards God. And I, I've been in that situation where I've asked God, you know, why? And, and it's unbeknownst to me what, what possible good reason could be for this. And so instead of the, well, I'm sure God has a reason, I started off on a study. It's, it was not an exhaustive study. I'm going to study the Bible to look at what are reasons that God takes people to evil and suffering. And again, it's not an exhaustive study, but I found 14. Uh, and if you're looking for, if you're in the midst of this and you're wondering about this, there are some, um, uh, some one-sheet summaries of this. If you want the more exhausted kind, you can get this. But here's the front and back, Dark Night of the Soul, an overview that gives 14 reasons of why God is taking us through evil and suffering. Uh, but sometimes, even with that said, sometimes we really don't understand why we're going through evil and suffering. And one example of this is from Jeremiah 29. God says to the people, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. And Christians, this is one of your first verses that you go, oh, oh, oh. And you hang on to this tightly gripping. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. Now, here is, here is the stunner on this particular example. When God tells the people, I know the plans I have for you to prosper you to, and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope, it's, it, they are not in the land of blessing. Things are not going swimmingly well. They are in, as, as he says here, captivity. Babylon has come and, and overthrew, overthrew Judah and took most of the nation off to a desert land uh, to live a whole new life. Their, their past, uh, their homes, their businesses, uh, their towns and cities all left in rubble. And God comes to them with this promise I, to give you a future and a hope. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Now, that sounds like a great promise. And some of the false prophets, as you read in Jeremiah, 
came along and heard Jeremiah, and they started telling the people, it's going to be about two years. Just hang on for a couple years, and, and God's going to take us back, uh, back to the land of Jerusalem. And Jeremiah said, no, 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 no. And the message was that the captivity for some of those folks was going to last up to 70 years. If you're thinking, if you just read, I know the plans I have for you to prosper and not to harm, to give you a hope and a future. What if you're the person that's going to be in the land for 70 years? You are going to die in that land and be buried. What is God saying here? Well, partly it makes no sense to us if we do the math. God is speaking to the nation as a whole. And some of those people are going to live to see this happen, as we'll read about in, in Ezra and Nehemiah later on. Uh, but, but some of those folks are going to live and die there. And Jeremiah tells them, build your homes, plant your gardens, plant your crops, raise your children. You're going to be a citizen of Babylon. It's hard to wrap your mind around that if you're, if you're reading these promises. Um, and if it's hard to get my mind around things, sometimes another good verse that we go to is Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, where God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. This example from Jeremiah is certainly one of these things. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, this is a head-scratcher example. But the greatest head-scratcher example is from the book of Job. Uh, and, you, and perhaps you're familiar with Job. We start in Job 1.1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless, upright, feared God, and shunned evil. Now, he's going to go through horrific suffering. But it's not because he did something wrong. The, the, the play starts out with this is an exemplary fellow when it comes to people. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. Had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Now, uh, as Job chapter 1 uh, moves on, on one day, the following four things happen. Uh, the first is raiders come to one of his ranches and, and take off all the oxen and donkeys and kill all the servants who are watching them. Wiped out. One of the ranches, gone. A second ranch has a fire that comes and destroys all the sheep and kills all the servants who were shepherding the sheep. At another ranch, the third episode happens where raiders come and they steal all the camels and kill all the servants who were watching the camels. And on, just before the day ends, there is a, some type of tornado that hits one of the houses that he owns where all 10 of his children are eating together. And they all die. All this in one day. And the first response that Job has is at the end of chapter 1, verse 20, says that this Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. These are symbols of grieving, of lamenting. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away May the name of the Lord be praised. And all this Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Now, this is an exemplary example. But uh, as we will see, and if you've gone through times of evil and suffering, you may have your days where you're sort of like Job here. But there are other days when the questions start to bombard you. And sometimes it feels like such a, such a battle every day to deal with this. Well, so he has this response. But after this great response, chapter 2 comes, and we find that Job has been afflicted. His whole body was sores from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He is now in utter physical misery. The only thing that is not affected is Job's wife. And I wonder if Satan had a... I mean, I don't know much about Job's <laughs> wife, but I, there's enough to say she was not a peach to be married to. I'll just, just leave it at that. 
But uh, so Satan thought, well, no, no, we're, we're going to keep her around because she's, she's doing my work with this guy. Well, from chapter 3 through 37, most of the book, four friends come on the scene. And the first three give him a week to sort of recover from all of this. And then they start in. Now, these are well-intentioned friends. Um, but all four of them do a total of 13 different monologues at Job. And for all 13 of these monologues, there is some element of truth in them. Like one fellow might say, the theme is God is righteous, or God is just, or God is loving. God has a purpose. He's sovereign. There's some element of truth, but the problem with each monologue, it's not enough truth. There's not enough perspective here that helps Job. And rather than help Job, it makes his suffering worse. And this is one of the things that you take away from the middle of the book of Job. Do not be a friend like Job. That is certainly a bad idea. And finally, at the end of chapter 37 uh, and the beginning of chapter 38, uh, the writer says, and Job quit speaking, which was a good thing for Job. But it's starting in verse, or chapter 38, 39, 40, and 41. Now God speaks. And for all these chapters, chapter 3 through 37, God has been, or Job has been asking questions of God. Um, why am I going through this? How could you be good? All the kinds of things that we ask. And now at this point, God turns the tables and he says, I've got questions for you. And when you first read this, you think, if, if I was this way toward anybody else who's suffering, you, you would, they would be like Job's friends. You'd, you'd want to say, please don't, please don't bother ever calling me again. But when God does this, he is trying to make a point that Job desperately needs to see. And the questions are rhetorical questions like, where were you when the earth had its foundations, Job? Where were you when I made Leviathan? Where were you when I made the, the sun? Where were you when I made the elephants? It's those, where were you when I made the flowers? And what he's doing is reminding Job that Job finds himself above God, questioning down towards God, and God is saying to him, you've got that upside down. And you are not going to be able to weather this storm unless you see my goodness and my power, which is evident in those rhetorical questions in chapters 38, 39, 40, and 41. And by the time he gets done, Job is quiet. He has gotten the message, and his response in chapter 42, there are, there are four things that he says. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. No matter what is going on, no matter how bleak it looks, no matter how difficult and painful it is, God is telling a story that with his purposes, and I am a part of his purposes, and at some point, no matter what this what this looks like to me, God is going to have the final word. He gets to write the last chapter and the epilogue. That's the first thing he realizes. You asked, meaning he's speaking to God, 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 you asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? In other words, he's saying, Job, left to yourself, trying to discern what's going on, you're, you're, you're going to skew and, and obscure, make cloudy what I'm trying to do. You're going to be your own worst enemy as you try to figure this out. Then he says, surely I spoke of things I did not understand. So Job gets this message. Things too wonderful for me to know. And here is where he has a humongous change of mind. What he realizes in all those questions and all the, the God's power and goodness in creation, all the many, over 75 different examples, what he realizes is God is powerful and he is good. He's powerful and he is good. And the purposes that are not going to be thwarted are, he puts the, the word wonderful. We say, by the way, Bart, those songs you picked today were, were delectable for this message. That's the story here that he's giving to us. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. 
And then Job says, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. It's one thing to know about God theoretically, generically, but what, what God has done is he's come close to Job here in his suffering personally. And there's something personal that's going on between God and Job. Therefore, he says, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, that word despise there needs a little bit of, of uh, clarification. When we use that word, that phrase, I despise myself, what we typically mean is I'm just no good. I'm a terrible person. I'm a terrible excuse for a human being, and I should just walk around with my head down and flail my back for all my failures. That is not what he means here. What he means is who I was as I thought about my life and all of this. He said, I just made this worse. He says, I despise myself, meaning there's a change of mind, change of thinking, a change of attitude, a change of heart, a change of perspective. This is, comes with the, with the next phrase, I repent in dust and ashes, meaning I gladly repent with the perspective I'm going to hang on to. Now, I mentioned that um, I did this study, Dark Night of the Soul, a number of years ago. And there are 14 uh, factors. Now, this is a summary sheet. This is meant to be just a, a sit down for about an hour and do it. But there's a, a longer one if you would, are so interested. But these are some of the ones I came up with. Um, one of the reasons is, is that sin runs much deeper in our lives than we imagine. Uh, we justify, rationalize our sin. Uh, we are rebellious. And it takes a whole lot more work to change that than we imagine it does. This is one of the things that it works and evil and suffering. Second, we live in a fallen world. There is a lot more pain in reality uh, than we imagine. When I was a young, uh, in my young 20s, I was a hopeless idealist about the world, and uh, I've had to have reality beaten into me. Sometimes evil and suffering is the way that happens. There's a priority shift, number three, that needs to happen. We have all kinds of things that we put first in our life. And God says, no, no, that's a bad idea. I'm going to arrange these things to prioritize them in the correct order. And I need to be first at the top of that list. That does not just happen um, uh, mentally, but it happens through the course of dealing with our, our real true values inside. Uh, suffering is a part of becoming a Christian. Uh, this is part of, partly it's true. Uh, number five, one way that God glorifies himself is to leave us in a situation where our, our backs are against the wall. We have no idea how we're going to walk out of that. And somehow God does something and we go, how did you do that? We come, our, our love and, and dependence on God uh, and our commitment to him deepens. Number seven, a trust shift. Uh, we all kind of come to Christ, you know, believing we're trusting God. But there are also lots of other things that we, we find out we're trusting besides God. And little by little, God says, no, 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 I'm going to change how your, your, your trust metric and how that works. Number eight, or, or number seven, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by feelings. We walk by circumstances. We walk by how life seems and how it feels and all those kinds of things. God said, no, you are going to be on a roller coaster if you live that way. Uh, number eight is he builds a greater anticipation for heaven, meaning that the things that we're relying on, that we, we Velcro ourselves to, whether it's a person or people or events or circumstances, and God comes along and sort of begins to unvelcro these things from our real hope. Uh, this is, uh, sometimes this involves suffering. Um, maturity, God works in us to make us more like Christ. Uh, the examples from the book of Psalms, uh, where um, suffering is normative. It is normative. Um, from from uh, the, the most skeptical to, to somebody like Job. Uh, verse, uh, number 11, the difference between God's real presence and his felt presence. We all want God's felt presence. That's what we, we you know, but, but God say, no, no, no. There's something deeper than that, and that's my real presence, even when it feels like I'm a million miles away. Sometimes that's part of the purpose of suffering. The metaphor of the desert, this is God's metaphor for change, where he takes the people, like in Hosea chapter 2, out to the desert, metaphorically, and strips them of all the things, their creature comforts, and all the things they're relying on for life. 
Verse 13, or chapter number 13, God's occasional discipline to get us on track, Hebrews 12, and seeking God first as our highest priority. Well, the last, uh, there are three conclusions that I drew from this particular study. The first is there are reasons why we go through times of evil and suffering, morally justifiable reasons. The second thing that struck me was whenever, whatever you're going through may not just be because of one thing. We ask, what's the one purpose I'm going through? Why am I going through this? Well, doing this study, I thought, you know, there are times where I think, I'm, I think number two is in play, number six, number nine, and number 12. And this is what makes this even more confusing for us as we're trying to discern this. We may accurately see one thing that God is trying to do in our times of evil and suffering, but there may be one that we don't see, or two or three. We may see three and not miss a fourth one. And the third, the third conclusion is that there are some times where we simply don't know. You can go through this list of 14 this afternoon, and you can come back, and, and you're going to email me or text me and say, Seth, I, I don't think any of those 14 are in play for me. This is also part of living life here. So one of the things that, um, this is called the inscrutability of God. Romans 11, 33 in your handout says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Even with the Bible and the knowledge that we have, we do not have exhaustive knowledge that answers every question. But we have sufficient knowledge to answer the questions that we should be asking. Now, in all my 50 years of being a Christian now, I have had skeptics starting in college ask me about the problem of evil and suffering. And they may like my answers or they may not like my answers. But I have never asked this question back to a skeptic. Now, you, you may, you may scarf at, scoff at, at, my, at the, what the Bible says about problem of evil and suffering. But how do you explain it? Tell me your explanation. How do you account for the problem of evil and suffering if there is no God? I've never had a skeptic offer an opinion as to that. And if you're a skeptic, either here today or watching online, I would give you that challenge. It's one thing to scoff at what the Bible says about evil and suffering. Let's see what you come up with and how you do. But I will tell you up front, your reasons are going to be weak and lame. C.S. Lewis, uh, when he was uh, a skeptic, as you all know, and for a number of years, the problem of evil and suffering was a problem for him. And uh, during World War II, he was uh, broadcasting on BBC radio to England. And what the broadcast ended up becoming the book, Mere Christianity, which is just one of those just amazing books. And this is how he described the problem of evil and suffering. He said, this is an excerpt from the book, My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I gotten this idea of just and unjust? <clears throat> a man does not call a line crooked <clears throat> unless he has an idea of what a straight line is. <clears throat> what was I comparing our universe with when I called this universe unjust? If I said that calling something unjust might just be a product of my own mind, that also did not help my unbelief. Instead, my argument against God collapsed as well. My argument depended on me or everyone saying that the world was unjust. In the very process of hoping to deny the existence of God by the problem of evil and suffering, I discovered that contrary to my original thoughts, the observation that the world really was unjust, my idea that the world that is unjust made justice a notion full of sense. Consequently, atheism turned out to be too simple which is a good example of why I said your answers will come be, be lame. At the same time that C.S. Lewis uh, was, was broadcast on BBC Radio during World War II, Bertrand Russell, another, or another noted atheist, was also broadcasting on, on <coughs> BBC Radio. And I just want to give you one little bitty excerpt because it's an example of the problem that a, sec, a skeptic has with trying to explain 
the presence of good and evil without there being a moral law. So <clears throat> in your handout, <clears throat> this is what Bertrand Russell said. Dachau, which, which was a concentration camp during World War II where many Jews and gypsies and Eastern Europeans were, were, were slaughtered um, in the gas chambers. Dachau, quote, unquote, is, Dachau is wrong. That's a sentence. He says, that is not a fact. Gravity is a fact. But Dachau is wrong, again in quotation marks, is not a fact. <clears throat> I think it is wrong, but I cannot prove it. Without a moral law, without something, without something straight to compare it with, which, which a skeptic, an atheist, has to agree to, there is no moral law outside of us. On what basis do you call that evil? Well, what, what Bertrand Russell said is, I know it's evil in my heart. I know inside of me. And we would say, that's the moral law implanted in you. That's why you know it's wrong. But he held on to his skeptical views. I, I, cannot, I cannot prove that it's wrong. That is the skeptic's dilemma when it comes to the problem of good and evil. Uh, evil and suffering. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, for those who are going through a time of evil and suffering in this season of life, I pray that somehow, in spite of the message or through this message, they would find some level of comfort, assurance, foundation, stability, and some level of confidence that you are telling a story where we are not to the last chapter and the epilogue yet. And for those who are skeptics, either here or watching, I would issue you this challenge. <clears throat> what is your answer? It's one thing to scoff at the Bible and the Christian answer. But I know of no source that gives the clearest indication of the factors of why there is evil and suffering and how God allows, his, through his purposes, sometimes allows this to happen. Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the, the inestimable wisdom that we have. And through your spirit to be able to discern something of what's going on in our lives, even when life is very confusing. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.